7. Family History Zachary, you are one lucky son of a bitch. Nathan was only dimly aware of Thibodeau's remark. Everything was black. For a fleeting moment, Zachary feared he had been blinded somehow. He struggled to remember what happened. It had to be a crash or an accident or... Or that little creep, Benny, he muttered. He could recall stepping from Decane's fancy Packard, and then bang, someone turned out the lights. Zachary's head swam, but the darkness that clouded his mind began to recede. He risked opening his eyes. The light was too bright. Everything looked blurry like an out-of-focus photograph, grainy and surreal. He took a deep breath and shook his head to clear his blurred vision. Big mistake. A wave of vertigo and nausea crashed into him like a freight train. He groaned. Right. Lucky. His stomach churned. Just let me die already. Pain arced through his temples, and then, like a miracle, began to subside. Something warm and soft rested gently on his forehead. Maybe he wasn't going to die after all. Too bad, he thought. Right now, death would be an improvement. Hush now, the both of you. A woman's voice, surprisingly deep and soothing, washed over Nathan. The boy needs to rest a spell. Zachary risked opening his eyes again. The light was still too bright, but this time, no one jabbed knitting needles into his skull. He was in a small dinghy room. Boxes and crates were stacked in one corner. He lay on a small cot, too small in fact. His feet hung off the end. A woman sat next to the cot. Her appearance would have been intimidating and stern, were it not for the humor and wisdom in her sparkling black eyes. She was tall with austere, regal features. Her skin was impossibly dark. Large gold hoops adorned her ears, and a heavy gold cross hung from a chain around her neck. She rested a maternal hand on his forehead. She was older than Nathan, but... Aside from a strand or two of gray hair and a fine network of lines at the corners of her eyes, her age was impossible to pin down. Where am I? Nathan said, his voice hoarse. Back room of the flying horses, Thibodeau said. The Cajun's leader sat on a rickety chair in the small room, facing the cot. This fine lady is Maman Leonie. She owns the joint. A pleasure, ma'am, Nathan said. He attempted to sit up. Maman Leonie smiled and nodded slightly, then gently halted Nathan's attempt to right himself. You just lie back, sweet. You have a nasty knot on that pretty head. Most people who go inside Shade de Can, they get a one-way trip into the swamp, Thibodeau added. Like I said, you're pretty lucky, mon ami. The evening wasn't a total waste, aside from a decent meal. I got a good look at Decane's place, and his men. Nathan closed his eyes as the throbbing in his head spiked. They're an unpleasant bunch, especially that creep, Benny. He is no local boy, Thibodeau said. He just popped up a few months back. Supposed to be some kind of mercenary. Figures. Decane's flyers are all hired guns, except for that coldfish kid of his. Nathan rubbed the bump on the back of his head. It ached to the touch. Plus, he's got a hangar full of ravens, all armed to the teeth, naturally. That's a lot of firepower. So? So Decane's is up to more than fixing a backwater air race. Nathan opened his eyes. The room wasn't spinning quite so fast now. He sat up. He's using the race to fund something else. Something big. Shh, ma fille, sois tranquille, Mama Mioni said, her voice calm and soothing. You want to be careful, you fool about too much, and you'll end up regretting it, I think. She reminded Nathan of his grandmama, a gypsy woman with a reputation for witchery. Though he'd left his heritage long behind him, he felt a chill run up his spine. Perhaps Mama Leoni was a mamba, a priestess of voodoo. They were not to be trifled with, these voodoo women. Hey, Mama, you worried too much, Louis laughed. This boy's got luck to spare. The Creole woman gave Louis a cryptic smile and took Nathan's hand. 
She turned it over and ran her red lacquered fingernail along his palm. Her brow furrowed as she looked at his hand and then into his green eyes. She folded his hand into his chest and patted it gently. This gypsy boy, he make his own luck, and that for certain. Thibodeau chuckled. You've got a pretty big cloud on the edge, so I'm hoping you haven't used up all your gypsy luck. We're gonna need it. This? Nathan pointed at the lump on his skull. This is nothing. Believe me, I've been through worse. But we've got work to do. You're gonna be okay for now, gypsy boy, Mama Leone said. But you and Louis, you're getting in deep with something très dangereux. She paused. You both wash up and come out front. I'll get you some coffee and a little something to eat. There are things you need to know about Henri de Cain. She stood up and placed her hand on Zachary's head, as if in a brief benediction, and then left through the door to the kitchen. Nathan grimaced. The headache was bad enough. Another cup of chicory-laced coffee made his stomach churn. He remembered the slip of paper that Emmeline had passed him during the dinner at de Cain's estate. His flight jacket was tossed over one of the crates in the storeroom. He checked the pocket and was relieved to find the scrap still in his pocket. He unfolded the paper. It read, Mr. Zachary, please be careful. They don't trust you. Send Tommy my love. Now you tell me, he muttered. Tug was a lucky man, all right. Emmeline was honest, kind, and brave as hell. It took some real grit to pass this note right in front of her guardian, her fiancé, and a pair of gunmen. He put the note back in his pocket and made his way to the kitchen. Once Mama Leonie was satisfied that Nathan and Louis had full cups and full plates, the proprietress of the speakeasy launched into her tale. Henri de Cain claims to be from New Orleans. That his family had been here in these parts since forever. She scowled. It's all a lie. He came to town years ago, broke and trying to get a business off the ground, with no luck. But he's smart, Henri is, so he finds himself a local man, Guillaume Fontenieu. He's not so smart, Guillaume, but he's got some money, some political connections. Henri becomes his friend, and soon they become partners. Henri ran the business. Guillaume was just a figurehead. They prospered. Soon they got nice cars, nice homes and nice wives. Henri, he married a girl, Virginia, from a good famille. She was a sweet girl, but weak. She passed away soon after Bertrand was born. Didn't matter none to Henri, though. He had a male heir, and that's all that mattered to him. That and money. Guillaume married, too. His wife was a nice local girl, and soon enough, along came Miss Emmy. Guillaume busied himself with his new family, and Henri, he stayed busy making money. And he always wants more, more power, more money, more prestige and influence. Pretty soon he's running guns, stealing, blackmailing, the works. All under the respectable front of the business. Guillaume figured it out though. He threatened to end the partnership and to turn Henri into the police. So Henri arranged an accident. Guillaume and his wife died in a plane crash. There was never any proof. Henri paid off the judges and the police. But most folks still think that de Cain sabotaged the plane. So that's when Emmeline inherited her folks' money, and how she ended up under de Cain's thumb, Nathan said. She nodded. This Henri, he's not a man, he's a demon with no heart. And the son, he's no better than his papa. Worse even, he knows his papa is a bad man, and he don't care. Zachary studied the grounds in the bottom of his coffee cup, then set it down on the table. All the more reason to take the bastards down a peg or two. This ain't just fun and games, Mama Leone said. He killed the girl's parents, and he'll kill her too. You go fooling with the cane, you're gonna need more than gypsy luck. Mama Leone grabbed Nathan's hand and turned the palm up. She pointed at his lifeline, her voice stern. This ain't a guarantee, boy. If your luck runs out, only the cane gonna kill you too. Eight, the best laid schemes. Nathan took a healthy slug of Louis' bourbon and leaned back in his chair. The back of his head still ached, but he felt a great deal better than he had in the flying horses. 
From outside, the muffled sounds of someone working on an airplane made his temples throb. The trip back to the Cajun's hideout had been without incident, nowhere near as harrowing as his first flight with Tug. Louis was a good pilot. Unlike his young protege, he didn't show off by pruning the treetops. He looked at the clutter in Thibodeau's makeshift office and grinned. You ever consider hiring a maid? He quipped. It looks like a bomb went off in here. Louis gave Zachary a sour look. Very funny, he replied. We can't all live in a zeppelin. Some of us still have to get our hands dirty. Nathan chuckled and handed the bourbon bottle back to Louis. Touché. Thibodeau snatched the bottle from Nathan's hand and set it down on his desk, hard enough to knock over a half-full cup of coffee perched on top of a stack of navigational charts. Relax, Louis, Nathan said. The way you're carrying on, you'd think you were the one who got clobbered by Decane's goons. Thibodeau paced around the tiny office, an uncharacteristic scowl on his face. I ought to clobber you myself. From outside, the metallic clinks and whirs of airplane maintenance grew slightly louder. The pounding in his head aside, Nathan found the sounds familiar and comforting. The Cajun's base might have been in the middle of a swamp, but the joint was always bustling. Next, you'll try and tell me that getting smacked in the head was all part of your big plan. Louis said. Well, not exactly, Nathan admitted. So now maybe you'll let me in on whatever this big scheme is. Louis stood in front of Nathan, arms crossed. For a moment he seemed distracted by more noise from outside. The clanging ring of metal hitting metal. I already told you the plan. The high points, leastways. Nathan sipped his bourbon. And I still don't believe you, mon ami, Thibodeau said. You're always playing some angle, and I have the feeling you're playing me for a sap. Thibodeau started pacing again. Now you got all Henri on my back. He looked skyward, as if seeking strength from a higher power. You'll get the way clean, Louis, you said. Don't worry, you said. Nathan had to suppress a chuckle. Louis looked like he was about to have a heart attack. Look, he said, maybe I didn't tell you every little detail, but... Zachary was interrupted by a blast of noise. It sounded like a gunshot, loud enough to make both pirates jump. Mon Dieu! Louis exclaimed. Nathan and Louis ran outside, and Thibodeau grabbed the nearest Cajun, the big man with the obscene chest tattoo, by the arm. Hey, Marcel! he demanded. What the hell was that? The big pirate looked puzzled. What are you talking about, boss? he asked. That old dog fella's fixing up the planes. What? Louis exploded. What old dog fella? Nathan cleared his throat. He's talking about Doc Fassbinder, a friend of mine. Louis rounded on Nathan. Zachary braced himself. Thibodeau looked like he was going to take a swing at him. Let me guess, another little detail that you somehow forgot to mention, we? Oui? Nathan nodded. You know, mon ami, Louis seethed. Ever since you blew into town, my adults become Grand Central Station. Before Nathan could respond, Louis reeled around again to face Marcel. And you! Do we just let anyone wander in here and stop fooling with our birds? But Doug said it was okay. Louis shook his head in disgust. He waved Marcel away and scowled at Nathan. Any other little surprises I should know about? As a matter of fact, yes. Nathan clapped Louis on the shoulder. Come take a look. I can hardly wait, Louis groused. They walked across the pirate compound toward the machine shop and repair hangar adjacent to the landing strip. Nathan felt a surge of excitement. His devastator sat just outside the hangar. The plane was painted a vibrant blood red, offset by curved black and white trim. Aside from the fortune hunter's insignia on the wings, the plane's sole decoration was nose art. Painted just below the cockpit was a scantily clad woman, nominally dressed, as a fortune teller. She gazed seductively from within a crystal ball. Beneath the picture were the words, Gypsy Magic. Nathan's wingman, Jack Mulligan, painted all of the fortune hunters' nose art. Most of the fortune hunters agreed that Gypsy Magic was Jack's best work. He had real talent, too. If Jack ever tired of piracy, he could make a mint as an artist. Once after a skirmish with the Hollywood Knights, 
Jack was mortified to find a line of 30 caliber bullet holes had marred the fortune teller's beauty. Nathan, you get her shot up again, Jack had griped, and I'll sock you in the jaw. Zachary's pleasure at the sight of his plane diminished as a second blast of noise erupted from the hangar and blue-gray smoke puffed from his plane's exhaust. He smelled burning oil. There was a torrent of German from beneath the plane, and a thin, stooped figure stepped into view. He kicked the Devastator's front tire and cursed. The dumped piece of... Hey, Doc! Nathan called out. Take it easy! Doc Fassbinder squinted through his soot-streaked goggles for a moment. His face brightened as he recognized Zachary. Ah, Nathan, my boy! He exclaimed, delighted. So good to see you! Fassbinder was older than Nathan, in his seventies, in fact. Despite his advancing age, he moved around with the vigor of a much younger man. He was thin, and a network of deep lines crisscrossed his face. An unruly shock of silver-gray hair formed a halo around Doc's head. Humor and mischief shone in his blue eyes. Nathan had known Doc Fassbinder since the Great War. At 16, Zachary had lied about his age and joined the Escadrille Lafayette, pilots fighting the Kaiser in the Great War. What started out as a youthful adventure ended in disaster after Nathan tangled with Heinrich Kissler and lost. After Kissler shot Nathan's plane to pieces, the young pilot spent most of the war in a German prison camp. Wilhelm Fassbinder was in that camp too, the Kaiser took a dim view of Doc's refusal to develop war machines for the military. Nathan, Doc, and a handful of allies broke out of the camp and fled to Russia, then Europe, and finally to the States. They'd lost touch with each other for several years, especially once Nathan had formed the Fortune Hunters and turned to piracy. A few months ago, the Fortune Hunters sprung the Doc and his daughter, Ilsa, from the Boeing Special Projects Group, Doc and Ilsa had perfected a new fuel boost system that Boeing was wild about, and so were the Red Russians. Everyone who knew about the engine, codenamed the Blue Streak, was looking to abduct the Doc. Nathan and his gang got wind of the Fassbender's predicament and rescued the old man and his daughter, and filched the Nitro Booster in the process. Doc had traveled with the fortune hunters ever since. Nathan adored the old coot. Sure, his crackpot experiments and inventions occasionally blew up, but he was a bona fide genius. Nathan could barely remember the man who had sired him. In many ways, Doc was the only father Nathan had ever known. He gave the Doc a kindly pat on the arm. So, how's my plane? Doc fiddled with his tool belt. Ah, temperamental as always, he said, but she should be ready soon. Good, Nathan replied. He made introductions and was gratified that Louis seemed amused, even fascinated by the wily old scientist. They traded pleasantries, and Thibodeau finally relaxed a little. For his part, Doc seemed pleased to show off his handiwork. He slid aside part of the Devastator's engine cowling and explained his Nitro Booster to Louis. The booster could increase the plane's top speed by as much as 150 miles per hour in short bursts. Louis looked skeptical. You'll be lucky if the thing doesn't explode or just rip the wings off. Fassbinder looked wounded. It's not luck, my boy. It's science. See, Louis? Nathan interjected. Nothing to worry about. Louis snorted. Right. Nothing at all. Damn, Thibodeau still needed convincing, and without his help, this caper was sunk. You win, Louis, Nathan said. I'll tell you everything you want to know. And how do I know you're telling the truth, mon ami? Nathan's face was a mask of innocence. Hey, would I lie to you? Trust me. Louis shook his head in exasperation, but he led Nathan back to his office to talk. Nathan did his best to ignore the roar of the engines and the noise of the crowd. Decane's big race was just under an hour away, but the race course was already filling with spectators, racers, and bookies. Outside of free Colorado pirate enclaves like Skyhaven and Boulder, 
Nathan had seldom encountered a more disreputable mob. Races in Manhattan or Los Angeles were generally cultured affairs. The spectators at Decane's race were more interested in bread and circuses. Louis leaned close and pointed to the front of the vault building. There's the big man himself, he said. Henri Decane stood amid a contingent of his hired guns, including several cops. The gold tip of his cane reflected the thin, haze-dimmed sunlight. Let's go pay our respects, Nathan said. Just remember to stick to the plan. The pirates crossed the field. As they approached the canes, Nathan could see that the old man had a smile on his face. Hello, Mr. Decane, he said. The old man's smile faded at Nathan's greeting. Mr. Zachary, Decane nodded, his poker face firmly in place. It's almost post time, Nathan continued. Have you considered my proposal? Decane's expression darkened. He didn't like being confronted so directly or so publicly. Nathan struggled to keep his own expression neutral. If Decane actually agreed to Nathan's proposal, the whole plan was in jeopardy. Finally, Henri favored Nathan with an alligator smile. I have indeed, he said. I regret that I must decline. Your reputation speaks for itself. You're a liar, a cheat, and a thief, if I might speak plainly. Assuming that my profits were intact at the end of the venture, I would then have to split them. Nathan almost exhaled with relief, but caught himself in time. I'm sorry to hear that. He reached inside his battered leather flight jacket and withdrew a wad of cash. You've left me no choice but to back tug. And to protect my investment, I'll be flying today too. Nathan studied Henri's face intently. This was a poker game, and a good player always looked for his opponent's tells. Physical ticks that revealed much about the man behind the cards. If Henri was surprised or upset by Nathan's decision to race, he kept it well hidden. Instead, he merely nodded and said, Very well, sir. Time to up the ante. Nathan handed over the cash. Henri collected the stack of bills, and Nathan thought he caught a flicker of surprise in Decane's eyes. You appear to have overpaid rather handsomely, Mr. Zachary, he said. Not exactly, Nathan replied. He pointed at Thibodeau and added, My friends will be flying too. This time, anger flashed across Decane's face, but only for a moment. He croaked with harsh, humorless laughter. I am happy to accept your entry fees, gentlemen. Decanes counted the money, folded the bills, and then placed them in his pocket. Here are the race rules, Mr. Zachary, he said. The winner is the pilot who completes five laps on the course in the shortest amount of time. Either that or he's the only one to cross the finish line. Is that clear, sir? Crystal. Any racer whose plane is not ready to fly within five minutes of the starting gun forfeits his entry fee and is disqualified. Is that also clear, sir? Yes, Nathan said. Then good luck to you, sir, Decane said. He turned to his men and added, Come Sunday, I must remember to thank the good Lord for the heaven-sent parade of suckers he's seen fit to bless me with. The gunmen laughed at their employer's joke, all except Benny, who stared at Nathan with blank, dead eyes. It was time to prime the pump. Decane oozed confidence. Now Nathan had to shake that confidence. Zachary drew another stack of bills from his coat. The only amateur I see here is you, Mr. Decane, he growled. Perhaps you'd care to wager on the outcome of your little contest? I'm always happy to part a fool from his money, he shot back. Very well, I've got 5,000 francs that says Tug will cross the finish line before Bertrand. 5,000 francs, he said. Done. Perfect, Nathan thought. He didn't even hesitate. Decanes can't help himself. He has to take the bet. Decanes opened his pocket watch. By my reckoning, gentlemen, the race begins in 49 minutes. Good day. He clicked the watch shut. A clear dismissal. 
As Nathan and Louis turned to leave, Benny stepped forward and blocked Nathan's past. This time, he growled, you're gonna get more than a tap on the head, Zachary.